All right, well, welcome to our first Sunday series. This is the first weekend of the new year coming up. So today being New Year's Eve, I'm recording this on Friday. And let me silence my cell phone there. And um, tomorrow will be the first day of 2022. And also the first weekend, not only of the year, um, but the, this is the first Sunday of the month in which we take a look at a psalm together. And so we are on Psalm 6 in our series that we are doing once a month here. And I want to start off with just sharing a song with you that it, it was actually, I think, one of the first songs I ever wrote. It's called Revival in My Heart. And, and this was written uh, particularly for a group of middle schoolers in Southeast Portland, where we were ministering at the time at a little church there called Powhurst Baptist Church. And uh, so this was 2005, and it's a song about a revival, and revival starting in your own heart. That's where it starts. It starts in one person's heart, and then it can spread. So we always we always pray for revival, but it's got to start with you. And um, that's where God does that that work. So anyway, here's here's how the song goes. Revival in my heart, Lord. Revival in my heart. Revival in my life, Lord. Revival in my life. I want to see revival in my heart, Lord. Revival in my heart. Revival in my life, Lord. Revival in my life. I deserve the consequences of my sin. But in love you sent your grace to me, the only way that I can end. To your infinitely awesome glory, how could I forget? Lord, I know this sounds familiar. Forgive me. Your grace is sufficient for me. Your grace is sufficient for me. Yeah. Your grace is sufficient for me. Hallelujah, I'm forgiven in Christ my King. 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 Amen. Revival in my heart. And that is not too far away from what Psalm 6 is all about. This is a psalm of prayer. I'm sorry, a psalm of faith. And it is a prayer. And it's a good one. However, upon first reading, you might come across the psalm. And it, and it may seem kind of distressing. And because it is. And, and sort of this negative vibe. You might read it and go, oh man, that's, a, that's not a very good psalm. But you know, this is a penitent psalm and it, 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 it highlights a part of the Christian life that's very important. And, and that would be part of our faith in God requires us to agree with him regarding sin. That if God hates sin and if God um, has wrath towards sin, which is a rebellion against him and his nature and his character, everything that is good in his eyes. Sin is saying, I reject that. I have another idea. I want to do something else. And I don't trust you. Rather, I trust myself and anything or everything else but you. And so that is that is bad. Sin is bad bad because it's bad for you. And um, God um, commands us to agree with him on sin because he loves us. And an important part of the sanctification journey, the, the stirring up of our faith and the maturing of our faith is slowly agreeing with him over time more and more regarding 
sin. And he's he's gentle, he's kind, he's patient, he's long suffering with us in this process where he he's like tapping us on the shoulder and saying, all right, here's the next thing I want you to lean into me on. Here's the next way I, I need you to change your mind. And this is sanctification. It's a conviction. It's a reorientation. It's a it's allowing him to to say, yeah, simply change our mind about things that we are thinking wrongly about, that we are ways that we are living that are contradictory to um, um, our relationship with him, that are that are detrimental to our relationship with him, that are life zapping rather than life giving. And so this is a psalm of faith, and it's an important part of the faith journey. But as I was re- reflecting, even before we get into the text here in Psalm 6, I was reflecting about just the the different aspects of, of faith. And, and one of those um, is just faith in the Word of God. And so even before we, we dive into this particular text, it's an act of faith to approach Psalm 6 with an open heart with an open mind, allowing him to say, to say, here is what I want to do in you. Here is how I want to transform you. Um, there's, there's a, there's a very, um, it, it requires us to trust in, in the word that it's living and active and it's, it, it has its effect on us. Should we receive that effect? And so approaching Psalm six in faith, we are just that act alone is is exercising our our um, our walk with God, and particularly this this practice that our that our little church family has of of going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, Old Testament, New Testament. That within itself is an act of faith because it's saying to God with our actions and our discipline, God. As a church family, we want the whole meal deal. We want everything that you've said. We want to receive from you the prescription of truth for our lives in the dose that you have prescribed it. That if you talk a lot about something, we want to talk a lot about something. That if you repeat yourself, we want to have that repeated to us. We want not to have our axes to grind as we make our way through scripture from Sunday to Sunday, but we want your sword to, to be sharp and to, to cut all the way to, to um, divide, you know, like, like the word says joints and marrow dividing down to the nitty gritty. What is it that you're wanting to get to in our heart? And so this, this approach that we have to the scriptures as a church family I believe is a is a wonderful act of faith in him and his word because we we come to passages that are that are just more difficult sometimes. Sometimes and and this is one of them. I I when I first read Psalm 6 in preparation I've come to this passage many times in my life but as I came to it this time I, I was like man this is kind of a bummer starting the new year out in Psalm six, this is not, you know, a penitent Psalm. Oh man, this is like kind of a downer. Aren't we supposed to be like celebrating the new year and maybe something more inspiring. And yet in faith, just say, okay, this is the text. I receive it. I receive that. This is what you have for our church family this day, according to the plan that we've prayerfully set out um, and just want to diligently come to this psalm with with faith. And so I, I want to encourage you not only that we do that as a church family, but that you do that individually in your own um, study of the word, that you that you that you go through the scriptures and um, when you come to parts that are difficult or that you don't like, that you would press in and trust that there is something there for you. And um, my testimony in this regard is that I always find that he meets me there. 
in the strangest places in the in the scriptures. It could be deep in the nitty gritty of Leviticus. Um, on uh, I, I remember one part- particular passage I, I came to. Um, it was my my turn to to teach, and it was it was in the 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 chapters of in Leviticus regarding bodily fluids and the laws. And, and I was like, not excited about teaching that, that passage. However, it was a rich time in the word. It just took some digging and, and, and diving into and, and really wrestling with the text to get there. So Bible study is an act of faith. It will sharpen your faith. It will stir up faith. And it's a demonstration of faith when you approach the text trusting that there's something good in every jot and tittle in the scriptures. There is something good. Sometimes you just got to dig a little harder than other times. All right. So Psalm 6, a prayer of faith in time of distress to the chief musician with stringed instruments on an eight stringed harp, a song of David. Now, if you're a musician, um, you might be familiar with how the number eight works in in music, at least in Western music. Our our, um, octave scale is a total of eight notes, one and eight being the same note, just an octave apart. And so um, it's just kind of an interesting musical note there that we have an instrument that can play a full octave. quite possibly. Although it probably was a little bit different scale than what, you know, we are used to in the West with our major scale. Um, my, my hunch is being a, a, a psalm of distress, this was a harp that had a some sort of minor or um, uh, some mode that was kind of um, distress sounding as, as many psalms are. Okay, so, and this, and we know this because it says here, this is a psalm of David. So that that's helpful. To, to, to kind of, at least that we can guess when this um, may have happened or when this was penned in David's life. We don't know exactly when, it just says it's David. And we know a lot about David. So we know that he had some very distressing times in his life when he was on the run from Saul, when he was um, penitent over his sin, broken over his sin. Um, with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah and so on and so forth. There were, we have this, these narratives that are so helpful and in, in, in helping us identify with the kind of distress that David may have been in um, or was in as he was writing this. Okay. So verse one says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Uh, I want to turn to Psalm 38. Um, Psalm 38 elaborates on this idea. And I don't, I don't pre look these up and bookmark them because I want to give you time to look them up as well. I figure it's, it takes about as long for me to turn to a passage as it might you. Um, but in Psalm 38, here's here's a little elaboration on possibly what David, if this psalm was written over the same kind of distress, this gives us some more insight. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. A direct quote, verse 1 of Psalm 6 and verse 1 of Psalm 38. For your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger nor any health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. And he talks about inflammation in his loins. um, and, And it goes on. So if that, as I believe Micah taught that chapter uh, a little while back and, and suggested that, that um, it could be a description of a, his, this, um, the sin with Bathsheba because of the, the inflammation in his loins and the description there points to some sort of disease. Uh, well, without saying much more about that, you can fill in the blanks there. 
But be that as it may, or be that as it may not, that he is he's either in the same kind of distress as he is in 38, or he is um, in another situation where he's greatly distressed over his own sin. So verse two, oh, actually, before, before we move on, these words here, anger and hot displeasure, the, the best picture I can, I can come up with in my experience for those words are, you know, those cartoons where whether it be a bull or uh, another cartoon character that gets really angry and they turn red, beat red. And then they got, they got like steam or smoke coming out of their nose and their ears, right? Mm, And there's that, that smoke that comes out turning red. That's the picture. In fact, when he says, do not rebuke me in your anger, Anger, that, that word, that uh, specific Hebrew word is sometimes translated nostrils, right? So it's that idea of like air coming out of your nostrils, like, you know, uh. and then hot displeasure. It's literally heat, like hot, feverish, or, or this displeasure that, that this rage and this wrath. So, so picture that David is saying, God, don't, don't chasten me don't rebuke me in with that kind of um anger and that kind of wrath and that kind of rage with steam coming out of your nostrils or smoke and and your your face beat red he's he's pleading with god throwing himself on his mercy right out the gate now if you're if you're a child you you understand this sort of plea um, well, why should I say if you are a child, we've all been children. So let me just say that when you were a child and you were, you were about to get chastened by your parents, you would have s- said similar things like, uh, like, like, please, you know, throw, you're throwing yourself on the mercy and you're, and you're asking like, um, well, if you're bright enough, you're saying, Hey, can, can you send me to the, can you send me to my room? Well, uh, and cool down before you give me a spanking. Um, good parenting, good discipline um, would would fall into the category of, hey, if you're angry, uh, just wait a few minutes um, and until you, you you prayerfully calm down, you have good judgment, and you can discipline in love, not in rage, not in wrath. And so um, it's good for the child. It's good for you. Um, it's it's holy chastening with good judgment rather than this kind of wrath and rage that's just out of control where we often can do things or say things that uh where where um it goes past yeah holy chastening and gets into um to unholy chastening verse two and this that uh, david's like man just god could you yeah he's not saying don't rebuke me he's not saying don't chase him he's just saying can you do it with mercy and that's where he says in verse two, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me for my bones are troubled. This is a great way to approach our heavenly father. Not with not coming to him with strength and justifying our, our actions, but to say, God, I'm, I'm weak. Have pity on me like a beggar showing his wounds, showing that he has nothing. He he's stuck in, uh, you know, in the situation, sitting on a curb, just a beggar, right? That's, that is how we, we, we strike an arrow and and hit the heart of God by pleading for his mercy on, on such a one as us, rather than coming to him, standing up tall and strong and justifying ourselves. And, um, that's no way to approach God. You're not going to You're not going to um, endear yourself to his mercies that way. But, oh Lord, heal me for my bones are troubled. Um, Let's, this, this healing cry, let's turn to Hosea chapter six. This is a wonderful passage. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. 
Hosea chapter six. I I just in my margin wrote wow to this passage. This is a great one. You might want to circle this one, jot it down. Hosea chapter six, verses one through three. It says, Hosea says, come and let us return to the Lord. That's what repentance is. It's, it's a coming, turning around, right? So the assumption here is, here's the Lord. I was going that way. Come, let us return to the Lord, right? It's the prodigal son saying, get into the, you know, the slop in the, in the pig pen and saying, man, I had a better off in my father's house. And he changes his mind and he comes home filthy, dirty, but to be greeted by a father with loving arms, embracing him, giving him a ring and a robe and a, and a feast to welcome him home. So he says, come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn, but he will heal us. Okay. So there's that, that, that um, phrase that we came across here in Psalm six, where David says, heal me, heal me for my bones are troubled. So, so here we go. Hosea, um, continuing there, he, he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Now, if there's not um, a pointing to Jesus in this passage, I don't know. I don't know what um, you're looking for, because here he says after two days. So after two days would be a third day. He will revive us, and and and, and saying the same thing a second time on the third day, he will raise us up. Do you know? That when Jesus died on the cross and then three days, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Two days later, or or on the third day, he rose again from the dead. That we rise with him on that day of resurrection, Easter Sunday. Easter, we rise again with him. Now, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. And in by faith, we, we were resurrected on that day when he rose again from the day. That's what that's what faith looking back does. It makes it makes us a part of his resurrection. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And then looking forward, we we are well in the present we are living in in the resurrection life by faith. But by faith we are also looking ahead to the day where we are resurrected bodily and and all of the resurrection power will be poured out on you and on me. And so faith, it has that kind of transcendent, it goes over time where you have faith looking back at the resurrection of Christ, faith looking here in the resurrection life that we now live and faith looking ahead at the resurrection life we will obtain on the day he calls us out of the grave or calls us home in rapture. So, um, wow, this is Hosea, the prophet Hosea, a long time before Jesus raises up prophesying saying, this is going to happen. So he he's going to heal them. If they turn and repent, he's going to heal them. Yeah, he has torn, but he will heal. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Now, what's interesting there is that um, who was stricken? Well, it was Christ that was stricken on our behalf. Who was torn? Whose flesh was torn open by those by those cats of nine tails. Well, it, w- it was Christ who um, received those 40 minus one lashes and by his stripes, we are healed. You see, uh, God poured out his wrath on Christ that he would heal us. He, he is both gracious and just because he absorbed the just penalty that we might be free from the just penalty that we deserve. And um, again, a beautiful signpost to the cross and to the empty tomb. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter 
and former rain to the earth coming. And there's even a picture of a, of a two comings and um, the, the, the dew in the morning. Um, that's a picture of, it just covers everything, right? When you, um, when you go out in the morning here in Oregon, we have dew. And if you leave something out at night, it's going to be soaking wet in the morning because of that phenomenon of the, of the morning dew. Uh, so anyway, moving, moving back to Psalm six there, he says in verse two, Oh Lord, heal me for my bones are troubled. My soul is also, I'm sorry. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O oh Lord, how long? Okay. So there's a lot of times the bone bones are used in scripture and sometimes even the church is, is referred to as the bones crying out. But here bones are referring to, I believe the soul verse three, right? My bones are troubled. And in verse three, my soul is also greatly troubled. So, um, it certainly in, includes the physical bones of David here as he's, as he's saying that it has to, right? He's saying bones, but I believe there's more to that. That is bones are troubled, uh, points to verse three. My soul is also greatly troubled. Now, if our soul is not troubled, if our soul is strong and renewed and our body is trembling, then no problem, right? Christ promised that we are going to endure trials of various kinds. Uh, the apostle Paul wrote about that quite a bit for he himself endured many trials and obstacles along the way physically, but all the while it was okay because his soul and his spirit were vibrant, were alive, were getting closer to heaven. And so that's no problem. But what is a problem and is a part of the Christian life is when not only do we maybe experience physical trembling, physical trouble, physical sickness, weariness, shaking in our boots physically, but when we experience that also on our soul that our spirit is troubled, the immaterial part of us. Now that's a whole nother thing. And when that's taking place, usually what's happened is you're under conviction of the Holy Spirit and God is chastening you. He's rebuking you. And you may be crying out, Hey, don't do this in your wrath. Don't do this in your anger, but he's still going to ch- discipline you. Why? Cause he loves you. The Lord disciplines those that he loves. Even earthly fathers do that. So how much more would our heavenly father with judgment discipline us with good judgment, pure judgment, know how to chastise and and chasten and rebuke us for our well-being, for our good, that he would turn it around to get us on track on the way everlasting. So um, he's saying, save me for your mercy's sake. I'm sorry, uh, but you, O Lord, how long? Verse three, into the end of verse three there. But you, O Lord, how long? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, like, oh man, how long must I go through this? The, the torture of my soul, the physical um, ramifications of, of sin. Now we don't, you can't always draw a line between like this sin equals this physical ailment, but sometimes sin does cause physical consequences directly. And I believe in the, in this case, he's, he's, he's experiencing that, but, um, but you may have cried out like, and you know, full well, man, I'm going through that. I brought this on myself. This is chastening. This is not just general persecution or, or, or general um, trials that we, that I got to face just as being in this broken world. But man, this is a direct result of something that I have done. How long, Lord, how long am I going to be troubled like this? My soul going to be vexed. And verse four, return, O Lord, and deliver me. Return, O Lord. That, that's assuming that he's not, you don't feel close to him. You're saying, come on, God, 
come back, return. Well, we cry return to return. Come Lord, Maranatha, come Lord soon. We groan, we cry out, God, come soon. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. I'm not the way I'm supposed to be. God, come back soon, return. That's what we cry as well. Um, And then he says, oh, save me for your mercy's sake. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, taking us to the New Testament here. Paul writing to the Corinthian church. First and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses chapter 6. Um, if you look at verse... Nine, as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. So there's that line, as chastened yet not killed. And then go go to... uh, Verse 1 of chapter 6 in 2 Corinthians. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So when does salvation come? Well, today. My friend, today's the day of salvation. That if you would cry out to him and say, save me, help me. That he would do that very thing. He would save you. That he would help you. Today's the day of salvation, friend. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. That what he did on the cross would count for you. And you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. You don't have to wonder. Like all the other religions of the world, I don't know if I did quite enough. I might be able to make it into, you know, nirvana or I might be able to make it into uh, whatever Valhalla or whatever the the heaven um, hope is that all the world religions have. There's one way to heaven and that's by Jesus Christ dying for your sins. You putting your faith in him and in him alone for that salvation that he would resurrect you from the dead on the day of salvation. And today's the day. Put your faith in him and you can know for sure you're saved. Um, I love that. I love that because he says in Psalm 6, Return, O Lord, deliver me. Oh, save me for your mercy's sake. That's today. That's today. Verse 5, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Now, I love ironic verses because I really think in one sense, David really gets this wrong. He says, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Now, in one sense, he's absolutely right. Because if you die, or if David, in this case, if David was to be dead, he's not going to be giving thanks, right? He's just going to be laying in his grave dead. And so David's saying, come on, God, save me so that I can give you thanks. Save me so that I can remember what you did. Now, that's a little short-sighted, and it's a little uh, narrow when, it, when you consider the gospel, because it's the death that we remember. So when he says, for in death, there is no remembrance of you. And, well, actually, in another sense, in the death of Christ, that is what we remember. That is the table that we come to. That is the cup that we drink. That is the bread that we break together during the remembrance of him communion. So in his death, there is remembrance. 
Now, if it were my death, I would just be a, a thought here, and then I would it would just fade away like a vapor. But in Christ's death, when I'm identified with that, there is remembrance. Not only of Christ, but there's remembrance of me because I will be resurrected with him. I will exist. I won't just be dead forever. Annihilated. So in his death, there is remembrance. And in his grave, we give thanks. David says, in the grave, who will give thanks? Well, in Christ's grave, we all give thanks. Because that's the only way we have access to heavenly places and eternal life. I love that verse. So was David right or wrong on this verse? Eh, both. Um, but I just love flipping this script here and just saying, for in the death of Christ, there is remembrance. And in his grave, we will give thanks. Verse six, I am weary with my groaning. You tired of this groaning yet? We're only six verses in. And this is a short penitent psalm. There's others, like, like the one we mentioned earlier, uh, Psalm 38 goes along, goes on much longer. Well, he's weary of his own groaning. You know, there is a good kind of groaning. Christians aren't to complain. We're not supposed to be complaining. But there is a groaning that is a part of the Christian life. And this is when we groan because we are repenting. When we, we groan over our sin, we're in agony over our, our the inconsistent um, actions that we have. We say we believe in God with, with our lips, and yet our actions don't always show it. And that inconsistency ought to cause us to groan. And he's weary of his groaning. He says, all night I make my bed swim. You think you cried enough over your sin? David swam in his tears, he says. Well, he's a poet, so there's some um, poetry in that. Obviously, he's not swimming in his tears. But all night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. David's not the only one that wasted away because of his grief. That his eye just, it was like just sinking into his head and wasting away. Bags under his eyes. Looking foul. Job also did the same thing. Job 17, 7, if you want to look it up. He says basically the same thing. My eyes are wasting away. They're foul with grief. And then there's some train tracks right in the middle of this chapter. You have this pause. Now, there's no say law here, but there's a definite break in, in thought. We have kind of a, um, a new musical movement if this was put to you. Uh, an eight-stringed harp. And perhaps we go from a minor key to a major key. In verse 8, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now, um, this one jumped out to me because um, there was somebody else that says that same phrase, quotes that. And it's none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus, who in Matthew 25, well, let's turn there. Matthew 25, verse 41. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So here David says, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Depart from me, 
you cursed. There's coming a day where the enemies, not of me, but the or you, not your enemies, not my enemies, but the enemies of the Lord will be asked to depart. And they will be cast out of his presence and there will be no returning. So we don't need to be worrying about casting people out. We don't need to be worrying about the vengeance that needs to happen and and knowing who's the, who's the enemy and who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. We don't need to be worrying about that. Um, because God is going to take care of that perfectly and justly. It's the next verse that, that we need to hold on to. So depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Hey, give that to the Lord. He's going to say that in due time. But hold on to this one. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. So here he is groaning. He's even weary of his own groaning. But he comes to a place. Now, I don't know how long it took him to get there. It took him long enough to get tired of his own groaning. But he comes to a place where he says, I got it. I have secured it. The Lord has heard my voice. He's heard my weeping. Past tense, it's done. He's heard me. It reminds me kind of of David's situation when his son, his first son with Bathsheba died. Before he died, he was on his face, just pleading with God for the life of his son. That God would spare his life. But when his son died, he bathed and put new clothes on and got up and fixed his hair and got on with life. Because he came to, he, he, there was a transition there. You see what I'm saying? That there's a time for weeping and mourning over your sin. But then there's a time that comes when God says, okay, get up. And it's funny because it's it's not like we're earning his grace or his mercy by like how many tears we shed or or but there needs to be sorrow over sin. There needs to we, we because we are we are these sub- subjective people. We don't we don't experience all things at all times um, in all places all at once. <laughs> like God, he's he can he's outside of time and all that stuff. We need there's a process for us. And when my son or my daughter um, has done something they know is wrong, they need to go through the process of going, I was wrong. And I'm sorry about that. And I'm sad that I did. I regret that I did it. And I want to make it right. What can I do? I'm throwing myself on your mercy. Grace, grace, daddy, grace, right? That process is, is important. And there's no... There's no fast pass. Uh, you got to stand in line. There's no, um, uh, sorry, that's a Disneyland reference. I don't even think they do those anymore. Those fast passes. Those were a great invention when I was going back in those college days, um, skipping lines. You just got to wait in line though. You got to go through the process. Um, there's, there's no shortcut. You just got to wade into it. God will take you through and get you out on the other side and he will hear your cry for forgiveness, for grace. When you throw yourself on his mercy, you can get to a place where you say, I got it. I have it. He heard my cry. Verse nine, the Lord has heard my supplication. Again, the Lord will receive my prayer. So we have a past and then we have a future the Lord will receive my prayer. I like that. You see, I think David has had a, had this idea that things aren't all wrapped up yet. There's there's these loose ends. Even, even when his life was over, there was going to be another day that he needed God to hear his prayers. And there's coming a day where um, our prayers will be stored up in a bottle and they will be precious to God even in the future. And um, there's coming a day where um, 
he is going to deal with 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 our cries and our pleas in a way that we haven't we can't even experience in the present um perhaps you've been praying a prayer for years for years and years and years um the lord will receive my prayer says david i like that and then verse 10 let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly now at first glance you might look at that verse and go oh that doesn't seem very new covenant right let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled i thought you know matthew 5 jesus is saying love your enemies you know pray for those who persecute you you know what's what's going on with that well what's if you think about it though he's not asking anything that he is not himself going through he's asking really for his enemies here the same thing that he's going through let all my enemies be ashamed he's ashamed greatly troubled he's greatly troubled his soul is vexed he's shaken his bones he's troubled to the point of his bones are troubled and let them turn back he's turning he's he's repenting and be ashamed suddenly he's he's gone through this process and so he is in a way you could you could read this and be like ah let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled ha 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 on the other hand he he could be very new covenant matthew chapter 5 on this and saying let all my enemies also go through this process of being contrite over their sin being humbled by looking at it in the face and going this is ugly i don't want this i'm throwing myself on your mercy and um may we may we be christians that embrace this process may we be christians that are um, not afraid to wade into the distress of a repentant heart that we might come out and saying, I got it. I have his forgiveness. He's heard my cry and I'm not going to continue to walk in this sin because I've, I've got it. And I agree with God about this and I'm going to um, walk in the newness. He's given me a fresh, clean slate this day that I don't have to sin that I can walk in holiness and in righteousness. And um, should I stumble again in this way, that I would be still troubled over it, not growing calloused, but sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This is sanctification. It's an important part of it, but it's good. The chastening of the Lord, He loves those who He chastens. If he doesn't chasten you, then he doesn't love you. So receive it. Be willing to receive it, whether it's by him, by his word, by a brother or sister in Christ who is coming on behalf of the of the truth of God's word to bring rebuke to you gently, hopefully. But be the Christian that receives it well, humbled, um, and and allow God to bless you. May this year be a year in which you you your faith is stirred up to the utmost that you walk with him through the distress over shortcomings to find yourself a victor over various traps and snares that our enemy might be setting before you in this 2022 year you have all the resources god himself with you may you be victorious over anything that comes your way. So God bless you. Happy New Year. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday if you are willing and able to come. Um, And until next time, when we hit up Morning Madness next week. All right. God bless you.